a how's it going steve hey how's it going Owen? pretty well how's the conference been i i was at the opening session that was great um i haven't i did, wasn't able to be at any of the other ones yesterday afternoon but the opening session was awesome thank you yeah no it's going pretty well cool um i have a bad internet connection in my house so i'm starting this off on my phone gotcha um here we go. We got Andy. I'm I'm gonna make you guys all uh, co-hosts, okay? Oh, that's fine. Hey, Andy. Good. Hey, I was saying hello to you, Steve. Hey. Hi, Nolan. Good morning, guys. Morning. morning. It feels early on Sunday here in Seattle. Does it? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of early here too, even though it's my, noon my time. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Nolan, is, is it like 100 degrees down there in the Bay Area right now? It, uh, it got there yesterday, or yeah, That's, yesterday it was like 95. It's crazy. Oh, I, really? That's insane. Yeah. That's more than like, uh, normal like i know we can't say indian summer anymore so indigenous people's summer right, right. that's no, like that's fortune crazy. hot for october that is crazy. i don't ever remember it being this hot but i say that every year now yeah right right that's the new yeah right yeah hey robin hey robin <laughs> robin's now doing what i do i right say hello to everyone when you're, you're muted you're muted robin <laughs> You're muted still. Is there a chat? Can we... Your mic is muted. My microphone's muted. Can I hear you? I still can't hear you. How about this? Yes. There you go. Okay. Oh, that's or, hey. Here, right? <laughs> it's 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 very rare that we would say Robin Anderson is muted. Right, exactly. <laughs> That'd be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I can remember what I was gonna say, dang it. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at my notes while I was eating breakfast. It's like point between oh, reading so the much. reading the newspaper and looking at my notes. <laughs> so if I just start if I just start reciting uh, current events from the paper, <laughs> someone someone remind me it's your notes, Andy. Your notes, not the not the not the time. Andy, is the order going to be that you and and Mickey are going to speak first, then Robin, then me? I thought what? actually I thought actually the opposite. I thought that you might lead. Oh well, so because I was sort of assuming that you were gonna talk about the VINs thing first. No, I was gonna do the VINs last, but I can do VINs yeah, first if you wanna. I think that with, if you wanna do, if you wanna do, cause like, yeah, I was sort of assuming, <laughs> I was sort of assuming you were gonna talk about that. Well, you missed the beginning of our call the other I day, did. Steve. I did. Because I, I know, I'm, I'm joking. I don't mean, I know yeah, you were Yeah, Steve, teachers. we elected you to start. <laughs> yeah, why you weren't there. Students. Huh? Sorry. Students, are, they don't cooperate. They don't cooperate with. Schedule. I know. I know. Right. I actually that's a uh, that's a theme in uh, or a, a, a briefly a theme in my very in my in my notes. <laughs> they just don't cooperate. Yeah. Um, we can do it however you want, Steve. I can go first, but I think mine might be kind of a dud as a lead. OK, uh, Robin, what if you go first? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I was hoping to look at my more, uh, notes more carefully. Oh, so okay. Well, I see, yeah, I right. well, no, that's okay. Tough. No, I think I know what I'm going to say. Hey, I'm going to say what I said yesterday. So that's better. Hey, Mickey, how's it going? Oh, everybody. How are you all? Good. Good. We're just having a conversation about order of speakers because Steve didn't realize that we had, in his absence, nominated him to go first. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, since I'm introducing everybody, apprise me of the uh, new 
the new well, way. Well, we don't have one. We're 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 <laughs> navigating it right now. <clears throat> um. Well, look. <clears throat> I mean, I'm happy to start out with some of the, because I was going to read off the description, and the introduction. I mean, I could start with some of the challenges. I mean, it would probably make sense if we went over the propaganda model maybe first. But I mean, yeah, we're in a which bind, I thought, I Steve, go. I thought you were going to talk some about just teaching the propaganda model. I was, yeah, yeah. I, so I mean, I, that sounded like a great lead in to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I have kinda, an introduction. I'm going to introduce. Nolan's introducing me, and then I'm going to introduce, and then I'm introducing the the panel, and then I'm introducing each of you in order. Right. And then and, then I figured Steve would start off doing his bit and then Robin and, and then me to Andy. Just turn yeah. the lights on, honey. I'll wear these glasses. Just turn that, the that seems okay to you, right, Andy? Yeah, but Steve is the one who was raising the concern. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. I think it'll work great that way, Steve. Yeah, and Steve, you're gonna have at least, I mean, I'm gonna be, the introductory period is gonna be probably a few minutes. To set it up. Well, then, so then Steve could go, then I could go, then Andy could go. I was going to go last because Andy's I think, going last. Yeah. I'm going third after you. After so so me or Steve and then or Steve or then me. You I, don't do, care. I think I think I think Steve then you then Mick. I think we should just go the order we had it in the in the original description of the panel. Yeah. Okay. okay. Steve, you can just riff on the propaganda model. Yeah, I, I offered that. I was, I mean, How you teach it? What's it looking for? Mickey, Andy, everybody. It's almost, yeah. it's yeah, almost it's 10 o'clock. You guys yeah. are co-hosts. So you can let people in. Okay. Oh, I can let people in? Yeah, you, whenever you guys want. All right, hold. I, you guys let me know and we'll let people in. I'm ready. Are you guys ready? Sure. I'm ready. Yeah. Steve, are you cool? Sure. All right, I'll <laughs> let everybody in. Nolan, should we begin? Hi, everybody. My name is Mickey Huff. I am the director of Project Censored and president of the Media Freedom Foundation. Uh, I will uh, be moderating our session here 
this morning. <clears throat> Our panel, Critical Media Literacy, Project Censored and the Propaganda Model uh, is our topic for today. I will be introducing all of our panelists here momentarily. At first, I'd like to thank uh, Nolan Higdon and all of the wonderful organizers for the conference, <clears throat> uh, the Cr Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas. It's been a stellar lineup and it's an honor for all of us to be here. Um, it would certainly be lovely if we were all in person, but this is certainly a, a welcome alternative in terms of a platform for us to share this important information. Um, so again, special thanks to uh, all of my panelists as well. Thanks to all of you for registering and signing up. Uh, follow projectcensored.org once the events are over. I'm sure we'll have information to share with everybody about where you can find these sessions and recorded sessions if you miss them. So what we're going to talk about this morning, <clears throat> um, we're riffing on the propaganda model and its connection to critical media literacy and the longtime media watchdog Project Censored. In 1988, in Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of Mass Media, Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky, Noam Chomsky proposed a collection of institutional constraints, conglomerate ownership, dependence on advertising, reliance on government sources, flack, negative feedback, and ideology. Uh, as issues that systematically skewed the output of the nominally free commercial mass media in favor of elite interests that lead them to overlook or downplay stories hostile towards those interests. The propaganda model predicts, among other things, that the corporate news media's coverage of international affairs will distinguish between worthy victims, that is, victims of official U.S. enemies and unworthy victims of U.S. or its allies, and give significantly less coverage to the latter than the former. While the longest running media monitoring operation in the US is Project Censored, we date back to 1976 and we have long found similar tendencies in establishment news media's performance and in publications. We, um, we have showcased Herman and Chomsky's ideas over the years, applying it to critical media literacy pedagogy and we've incorporated it into our curriculum. And what we're going to talk about today with our panel. Um, this is a, a wonderful group of media studies professors and experts on media censorship and media freedom issues. They're going to all talk, and I as well, uh, about how we teach the propaganda model and make use of Project Censored's annual top censored stories each year. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this morning. We'll begin with Dr. Steve Masick. He's a professor of communication and chair of the Department of Communication and Media Studies at North Central College in Naperville, Illinois. He works with Project Censored on our validated independent news uh, stories research. He's contributed several chapters to our annual books published by Seven Stories Press. And Steve is going to give us an introduction and overview to the propaganda model. Uh, following Steve Masick, Robin Anderson, uh, will join us. She's author and professor of, of communication and media studies at Fordham University. She's written dozens of books and chapters and journal articles, including for us at Project Censored, uh, where she also serves as a Project Censored judge. After that, I will uh, do a segment on junk food news and fake news, and that will segue us into uh, our final panelist today, who is Andy Lee Roth. He's the associate director of Project Censored and co-editor of uh, now 11 editions of the annual yearbook. Uh, along with me, uh, we published that with Seven Stories Press. Andy coordinates our Projects Campus Affiliates Program, uh, a news media research network of several hundred students and faculty at two dozen campuses around the US, actually around North America. Um, and they do what are called validated independent news stories for consideration for our project's top censored stories each year. Now. Um, we're going to come around full circle, and the thread of our discussion this morning is based on the propaganda model. We'll update that more for the 21st century, and then, of course, we'll relate that to the critical media literacy pedagogy and curriculum of Project Censored. So thanks again for joining us, everybody, and we're looking forward to a great discussion. Uh, we're each going to go for somewhere around seven, uh, maybe seven to eight minutes max, and we want to leave plenty of time at the end to have uh, so we can discuss things, have questions, commentary, and so on. And we certainly look forward to uh, to maybe finding out if any of you are interested in using Project Censored curriculum in our critical media literacy pedagogy in the classroom or in your community involving independent media. So with that, 
Uh, please welcome Dr. Steve Macy. All right, thanks so much, Mickey, and hi, everyone. Thanks for getting up to attend this panel. Um, so as Mickey said, what I'm gonna be talking about is how I teach the propaganda model um, in my courses, and I'll, I'll also touch a little bit on how I use Project Censored's yearbook in connection with the propaganda model in my classes. I'll just sort of quickly say that I teach at a, at a private uh, Midwestern suburban liberal arts school. I'm, you know, as Mickey said, I'm chair of communication and media studies. Um, I teach, most of my students are, you know, want to become broadcasters or journalists. So they're a little bit more cued into or informed about the media when they come into my classes. And the class in which I, you know, spend a lot of time talking about, and we spend a lot of time talking about the propaganda model, although I do touch on it in some of my other classes, is of course called media criticism that all broadcasting and journalism uh, majors uh, take. Um, and in that class, I assign the, me the methodological chapter, the first chapter entitled A Propaganda Model from Chomsky and Herman's Manufacturing Consent, their 19, uh, 1988 book that outlines their theory of the propaganda model, which just, just to remind you, right, is that there's this set of institutional, of uh, five institutional constraints, what they call filters, you know, conglomerate ownership, advertising subsidy, um, reliance on official sources, net, you know, the role played by negative feedback or flack, um, and finally, what they in their original book called the anti-communist ideology that sort of constrain the formally free uh, private media, um, uh, you know, in their delivery and reporting of the news. And and um, Chomsky and Herman argued that this is that their theory is a testable empirical hypothesis about the kind of news that the corporate news media will produce. And one of the things they predicted is that it will skew towards fa favoring elite interests, um, that it will, um, will de-emphasize uh, stories about um, abuses of power by elite institutions um, and, and, and elevate uh, stories uh, that favor uh, elite interests. And that especially, as Mickey said, that in coverage of international or foreign, uh, or, or foreign policy news, uh, that, the, that they will distinguish between worthy and unworthy victims, worthy victims being victims of official US allies, um, and unworthy uh, you know, uh, or sort of you know, worthy victims being victims of official US enemies and unworthy victims being victims um, of official US allies. And if, and if any of you have read the book, you know that sort of the main focus in the book is on how the news media have covered the various wars that the US has been involved in, you know, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, in my class, I also, um, I also give them a, a follow-up essay by Ed Herman uh, uh, entitled the, Re the Propaganda Model Revisited. Um, I, I sometimes give them a chapter from a book by Anthony DiMaggio, When the Media Goes to War, where he actually tries to test the propaganda model against some more recent examples involving US wars, the US wars in, in the Middle East and, and you know, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and in my classes, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the various filters or institutional constraints and the sort of news that each of them might filter out or disqualify uh, from consideration. And we talk about that in connection with what is being reported in the news, you know, at, at the moment. Um, and, and we also, you know, talk about the, the worthy and unworthy victims hypothesis. Um, one of the things that always surprises me in those discussions um, is how many of my students actually accept almost all of what Chomsky and Herman argue as, as completely valid. I mean, it is really striking because I remember when the book was first published, it was incredibly controversial. It was denounced by all the corporate media as sort of overblown and as a conspiracy theory. But the majority of the students in my class accept I, you know, it, when they read, when they first read it, that this is a, this is a very valid interpretation of performance of the mainstream corporate news media. However, there's always a significant minority of students in my class who are incredibly resistant to and skeptical of the propaganda model. 
Um, and so we often in, in class have discussions about, well, what about the liberal bias of reporters? And there will always be students who identify particular reporters who you know, are particularly egregious in their liberal bias. And we have to talk about, we have to talk about that. There, there are always students who want to argue that the propaganda model is a conspiracy theory. Um, and that, <laughs> yes, and that's really interesting because um, as Chomsky and Herman repeatedly point out in, you know, in, and especially in subsequent interviews and, and essays, nothing about the propaganda model depends on intentions at all, right? The employees of the, of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, Fox could all be card-carrying socialists. What matters is <laughs> what the institutional constraints um, imposed on the mass media by you know, their, their need to make profits, their dependence on advertising, their reliance on government officials, sources of crucial information, et cetera, force them essentially to report. Um, Many, uh, in recent years, uh, many of my students have brought up the fact that Chomsky and Herman in, uh, in their writings about the propaganda model rarely mention the internet. Um, they do, it is certainly one um, sort of weak, weak spot in the propaganda model or one flaw of the propaganda model that when Chomsky and Herman are talking about the corporate media, they are essentially talking about the elite media, right? Their Washington Post, New York Times, the major network news media. Um, and, uh, and I do think that we might have to amend uh, the propaganda model in some way to take account for the fact that, that the, the, the internet has opened up the field to some degree and opened up the kind of, uh, you know, opened up opened up to some degree, uh, you know, uh, spaces for different sorts of news to be reported and different sorts of stories to be reported. Um, and uh, there's always in my classes, uh, students who, who argue that, um, that news that is critical of elite interests does get published and circulated every day and they always will hold up a few isolated examples and and that's where we kind of end up coming back to again and again that what the propaganda model is is a it's a prediction about the overall performance of the corporate news media not about how they might perform about you know in regard to one to a particular individual one particular individual story or another. Before I, I end and I know I have like maybe one minute left, I was supposed to talk a little bit about some some of the challenges um, that I have in teaching this, and I will say that one of the biggest challenges I have um, is that while my students do consume um, do consume a lot of news, um, uh, they are not particularly news literate. And they, they, that is to say, they consume news without knowing its sources, uh, without knowing who the reporters are who, are who originally reported the stories that they see popping up on their social, um, on their social media feeds. Almost all my students report that their major source of news is social media. Um, and many of them don't realize that the stories uh, that they report having heard about actually originated with you know, some New York Times reporter or some Washington Post reporter, or some, CNN, uh, some CNN report. Um, and so we have to actually spend a lot of time in class <laughs> talking about where the news that they see popping up on their social media feeds actually originates. And, and so talking about the propaganda model actually um, ser you know, serves the kind of broader function of making them more news literate because then they have to think about who is actually producing the stories that float through uh, their social media feeds. Um, and, and I say, I say I, that is always surprising to me because as I said, many of the students that I'm teaching in my classes are already broadcasting and journalism students. Um, but even those students are not getting their news sort of directly from the original reporters uh, who reported it, but from uh, their social media feeds. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Andy or whoever's uh, next. Yeah. So yeah, thank you, Steve, um, for that overview. We'll certainly have more time to come back. Um, up next, we're going to welcome uh, Dr. Robert Robin Anderson, who's going to talk to us about news abuse. She is um, 
longtime contributor to fairness and accuracy in reporting. And also um, we had the pleasure of having Robin write our news abuse uh, chapter this year for the forthcoming book, uh, Project Censored State of the Free Press 2021, which comes out December 1st. So Robin Anderson. Hi, Nikki. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited about talking about the propaganda model once again, because uh, in 2007, I was at a conference called Media and Propaganda at Windsor University. Uh, and they kind of evaluated its influence over the years and, and maybe what kind of things we should think about to add to it or maybe to alter it. And so uh, a number of our colleagues were there, uh, Deepa Kumar, Oliver Boyd Barrett, um, lots of other people. So I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying, Looking at the criticism then and changes in the media now and how we basically do media criticism and understand, uh, you know, Google and the whole infrastructure of the internet, um, the Project Censored, I believe, is addressing in its critical media literacy model um, and the way it's, it's teaching and designing curriculum. It's really addressing many of the things that, that Deepa and Oliver brought up in 2007. Uh, and one thing I think is really getting students to think about um, cr critical media literacy, looking at media with a values lens um, of inequality and racial injustice and creating alternative narratives and spaces uh, to con to liberate yourself from this mainstream model. Um, if we look at some of the things that were said in 2007, I think it, it, it'll uh, illuminate uh, that, that, that proposition. So one of the things that Oliver Boyd Barrett said was, we really need to recover agency that, that Chomsky and, um, and Herman posited was really a systemic issue. And Steve, some of the things you were just talking about that, you know, th th this is systemic. This is the way the media works and aligns itself with advertising and government and ownership and all of that stuff. And he said, look, the model was um, evaluated and, and proposed in the, in the mid eighties, a time when, when sociology was really trying to establish some systemic rules and provide systems. Um, and the agency had become a little bit disparaged. So he said, what if we think about some journalists who align themselves with the military industrial complex? Aren't some journalists, shouldn't they be held accountable? And if we think of Fox News and we think of Hannity and some of the other ones, we have been doing just that because, because you can make alliances with, with, the, with the forces of power and wealth and the powers that be. Um, but more importantly, I think the idea of agency uh, is, empowering the students. How are they receiving this message? What do they think? How can they express um, their position in the social structure, their evaluation of, of what's going on in their lives? And I think that, that we've seen a lot of that um, it, with the millennials and with the new generation of media scholars and media activists. And to illuminate that a little bit, I'll go to Deepa Kumar's point. And she was referring to her book that just came out outside the box about UPS and the UPS strike. And she said, look, I talk about the propaganda model and talk about how elite media uh, talks about labor systemically and disparages it and is always uh, taking the corporate side. And she said, but what I do in my book is I says, we need it. She said, I, we need another dialectical aspect to the propaganda model where we can put the elite media perspective uh, and, and how those interests of the elite media um, are challenged by, by the UPS strike and by labor and basically challenged by a countervailing force that, that's in our society. And I think, I think that, that the protests and Black Lives Matter, Occupy, we can now talk about structural racism within media discourse. We can now talk about Black Lives Matter um, openly. I think Occupy Democrat, Occupy um, talked about, we can now say that there's extreme economic inequality. If you recall, we couldn't say that before. We didn't have a 1%. We, weren't, we didn't think of ourselves as a 99%. And these ideas now enter into the public sphere. And, and I think this dialectic between what, what activists, 
with their agency, with their position. And don't forget, these people are facing a world that is an environmental crisis, that is terrible inequality, and they feel it themselves. So um, they're producing and starting to really uh, create and form their own liberatory narratives, which I think is very important. Um, the lastly, I think, I mean, they could never have taught, thought, understood how Donald Trump would come to power and basically hold power by deluding and a huge, a huge first in 2016, um, what was you know a bigger base than it is now by by well all these lies and 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 um, uh, false narratives that he proposed that they actually would, that, that people would actually give him a chance to govern this country. Um, that's astonishing. But we find ourselves in a moment where um, we, the people in the United States, our ideas, 87% uh, pro Medicare for all. Um, we wanna tax the rich. Uh, we wanna have leave. We wanna have all of these benefits and neither party are representing us and neither really uh, at times, a little bit in the in the elite media, but but they but they've rejected Medicare for all. Uh, Bernie Sanders as the main representative of that. Um, instead, they have accepted a narrative where we all of this can be justified because we're under attack and scapegoated from immigrants and all of those brown othered people and and given white supremacy. Um, uh, uh, a, a complete totalizing narrative that they now believe. And then it, it goes on to the virus and um, it, it coming from China and now it's QAnon and all of these strange cult conspiracy narratives seem to be allowing real information from entering uh, people's minds. And they're actually, many of them, when you talk about them, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that, but I'm still gonna vote for him. So, I think part of that, um, another person at the 20 years ago, one of our, one of our colleague scholars said, look, Chomsky and, and Herman talked about anti-communism um, as one of the main uh, dominant narratives that shaped all information. And then they thought, well, listen, we, we should really call anti-communism um, the dominant ideology. So, so one of the scholars said, look, anti-communism translated into simply terrorism after 9-11. After and all of that othering of communists then went on to uh, Islamic extremism and every way in which we justified, again, all of our, in this case, foreign policy and militarized tactics against the world uh, on the fear of terrorism. So now Trump seems to have taken that othered foreigner that, that, that we can find all the way back to Native Americans and slavery now and pull forward to the present moment. And he can say, these people are the problem. This is our country and we need to take it back. Um, and so immigrants uh, and Mexicans are, are criminalized and all of that. And as a primary justification for the kind of white supremacist, toxic masculinity uh, policies that he is continuing to promote and will promote if, if we allowed him to get back into the White House. So I just think that those are the kinds of things that we might be thinking about when we think of expanding the model. The use of video, the use of handheld cell phones, handheld devices and cell phones to tape the police brutality of, of mostly black men, but black women and trans people too, and how that also also went across the internet and allowed us to move forward with the, with the, with the notion that, that structural racism is now is now a thing um, and has been assigned uh, a, a part of, the, of the, the discursive narrative that we can now identify. Um, so these kinds of things we need to keep talking about and need to keep wondering about. Um, and, and also, of course, the, the ways in which um, Google and Facebook and Twitter so dominant that you could you could say that they're they're really um, they're really dominating the, the way in which public discourse is carried out in this country to certain to many sectors uh, of the country. And we need to start thinking about how how we can think about those things and how we can stop that because so many things um, are out there. Um, 
to, to censor Facebook and Twitter, which of course is not, is not the answer. So we need to start, I think, putting on some of our energies there and, and, um, and still uh, speaking to and encouraging our students as, as, we, as we have done at Project Censored with criti critical media literacy to do all those things. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much, Robin. Uh, and thank you to everybody in the chat area. Um, if you have any questions or comments along the way, we'll certainly try to come back to them. Looking forward to that conversation. Um, again, I'm Mickey Huff, the director of Project Censored, uh, president of the Media Freedom Foundation. Also uh, by day, um, I'm a professor of social science and history, and I chair the journalism department at Diablo Valley College in Northern California. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do at the project is stuff that we do in the classroom. So what I'm tasked with doing here right now um, in my allotted time is sort of carrying along and you, uh, some of you that know the project will see that we're kind of going through what we do in the annual books um, about media analysis. After me, Andy's gonna talk about censored stories. Um, you heard Robin Anderson talking about news abuse propaganda. I'm here to talk about another major challenge that we have in our news media. And that's something that the Project Censored founder, Carl Jensen called junk food news or Twinkies for the brain. And I'm gonna segue that into our infotainment culture of fake news. Um, so it's a lot to tackle, but again, I look forward to our conversation uh, when, uh, when we're finished with our presentations. Um, Walter Lippmann in 1920 in journalism and the higher law, Andy Roth and I wrote about this in the intro of Censored 2013, said all that the sharpest critics of democracy have alleged is true if there is no steady supply of trustworthy and relevant news. Incompetence and aimlessness, corruption and disloyalty, panic and ultimate disaster must come to any people which is denied and assured access to the facts. No one can manage anything on PAP, neither can a people. Well, that was a hundred years ago <laughs> and I'm not laughing because it's funny. Um, if we fast forward to the 1970s and 80s when Pro uh, Project Censored was founded, You've got this great gem. Right around the same time Carl Jensen coined the term junk food news, I'm gonna to get to a little bit of history about that. Um, many of you know that Neil Postman at New York University uh, wrote an amazing and groundbreaking work called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in 1985, when this was published, Postman wrote, our politics, religion, news, athletics, education, and commerce have been transformed into congenial adjuncts of show business largely without protest or even much popular notice. The result is that we are a people on the verge of amusing ourselves to death. And as Nolan Higdon and I quipped in the beginning of the United States of Distraction, quoting Lao Tzu, um, if we're not careful, we'll end up where we're heading. My big question is always, well, are we there yet? Um, we, have we arrived at this idiocracy about which we've been warned repeatedly over the 20th into the 21st century? Carl Jensen in the mid uh, early 1980s, um, Carl, um, he was receiving some criticism from the news media industry at the time because he talked about what they didn't cover. And they said, well, look, we are using news judgment, right? So we can't possibly cover everything. Well, now that we have the 24 seven news cycle, we'll get to maybe we can talk about problems with that, how time is used or how, how news judgment works. But, but Jensen said, okay, I'm gonna assess this fair critique of his own assessment that they were leaving out important stories often that offended uh, the elite and the establishment. Um, and Jensen said, I'm not just going to look at then at what you're not covering, I'm gonna look at what you are covering. And what he discovered is just a whole raft of completely useless, nonsensical and idiotic stories that filled up all kinds of column inches and time on network news. Um, and what he called this then was junk food news. Um, and he referred to it as Twinkies for the Brain. Uh, Andy Roth in our documentary from 2013, uh, Project Censored the Movie, Ending the Reign of Junk Food News, uh, kind of famously quipped uh, that junk food news was kind of like throwing back Pringles, uh, kind of like tied you over for a little bit, but 30 minutes later, you've got a stomach ache, uh, you, aren't re you haven't really uh, nourished yourself. And this is kind of what we do with our news diet. So part of the junk food news analysis of Project Censored is kind of a guilty pleasure for the students a lot of times because they get to go and look at what the vapid stories are that the news media covers, but they don't just look at this sort of brand name celebrity news. See, Carl broke this down into different categories, uh, celebrity branding, uh, sexual sex news or sex scandal kind of news, yo-yo news about the polls or who's leading in a race, uh, political race, craze news about what's the latest craze or fashion of the day, 
showbiz news, how it, you know this infotainment line is ever blurred. Uh, and now we have a reality TV star president, for example, um, and, and sports news and how that really like kind of takes center stage for a lot of people as being, well, as legitimate as political news or news about the public sphere. And last, he talked about how political news is, is covered often like sporting events, right? So Jensen laid out the specific kinds of problematic junk food news categories we have. And students analyze those every, uh, every year with us. This past couple of years, Susan Rahman at College of Marin, Izzy uh, Snow, and several others. Um, they not only look then at what the news media is infatuated with, but they look at what key significant important stories have been left out. And in a few minutes here, uh, Andy Lee Roth is going to talk about the validated independent news process and our top censored stories process. And that's a great example of critical media literacy in the classroom of take a look at these stories in the top censored chapter every year. And then you go and look at, well, what's go what were we covering instead? What was getting our attention instead? Right. And so it's a great way for students to really see almost in real time uh, how the propaganda model is shaping the news because ownership and advertisers seek profits and they go to sources that grab eyeballs. Right. And they tend to undergird the prevailing ideologies. And one of the most prevailing ideologies in corporate media, of course, is the, the supremacy of capitalism. Right. And so the main objective isn't to really inform the people and tell them about what's really going on, as George Seldy said in the 20th century, but it's rather to sell eyeballs to advertisers. And that's what tends to drive the news cycle of sensationalism. Now, I have a very limited time left to talk about the segue um, over to fake news. And it doesn't take um, much imagination to see how junk food news kind of morphs itself into fake news in the literal sense that the history of fake news going back a couple of centuries was often seen as hoax news, completely fabricated false stories, either for deception or entertainment. Um, by the way, Nolan Higdon's book, The Anatomy of Fake News, just out on UC Press, goes through a great history of the definitions of fake news, and I'm using it in class right now. It's a stellar addition to the using of the censored volume, our USOD book, um, as far as media literacy vehicles for students. And they really tend to be, I think they really work fairly well in the classroom, and students give us a lot of great feedback about it. Now, the problem with fake news in the present is that it's not just hoax stories or silly stories. It's propaganda. Fake news isn't new at all, it's propaganda and disinformation. And while some people, of course, are worried about QAnon and others are still worried about, you know, the, uh, the former IRA and the planting of fake news stories allegedly from Russia, um, the truth of the matter statistically is that very, very few of uh, the manipulations in our news system are coming from places like Russia. Most of them are coming right here from right here at home whether through our social media, through our own corporate media, which has a long history of fabricating stories, whether you go back to Judy Miller and the WMD fiascos or Jason Blair at the New York Times totally fabricating news stories, Brian Williams and NBC just totally making up news stories, getting fired, then getting welcome back somehow. Um, we do have a fake news program, um, fake news problem in the United States, but we argue significantly that it's really part of our own news media structure, the corporate establishment structure, and and the Herman Chomsky model still really accurately describes how news and information is filters to what audiences and to what ends. I mentioned earlier, Rob Williams posted, uh, I posted an article bringing it up to speed for the 21st century. We can get into that maybe later if we have time, um, but that would include things like bots, uh, uh, AI or artificial intelligence, deep state disinformation. Um, there's a whole host of new challenges we have and a new regime of censorship on social media and deplatforming that is incredibly challenging for us. And we think the antidote to that is critical media literacy education and critical pedagogy, not censorship or blacklisting. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over now uh, to my fabulous uh, associate director at Project Censored, uh, and good friend Andy Lee Roth, who is also the coordinator of our Validated Independent News Program. So with that, uh, I welcome Andy Lee Roth. Thanks so much, Mickey. And thanks to Steve uh, and Robin for uh, setting up a, a nice platform for me to, to speak from here now. Um, uh, I just want to go back and retrieve kind of an idea from Steve's initial comments that uh, the basic point of Herman and Chomsky's propaganda model is that news is filtered, that what news outlets present to the public as news is, is in Herman and Chomsky's words, a cleansed residue of potentially newsworthy stories, topics, and perspectives. A secondary point 
to the idea that news is filtered is that that filtering is a structural process. Steve mentioned this, right? The point of Herman and Chomsky's argument is that this filtering operates independently of the views, the desires, or even the awareness of the individual news professionals who are tasked with presenting us the news. Uh, and as Steve mentioned in Ch Herman and Chomsky's analysis, these five specific filters, to, again, to quote from uh, uh, manufacturing consent, quote, fix the premises of discourse and interpretation and the definition of what's newsworthy in the first place. And the result of that continuing kind of quoting Herman and Chomsky's language is elite domination of the media. And, and this is important for uh, talking about the censored news stories that, are, that is the focus of my presentation today, the quote, marginalization of dissidents, right? So that's the language of Herman Chomsky from that introductory kind of theoretical chapter to uh, manufacturing consent. So for me, uh, I've worked uh, in addition to being the associate director of Project Censored and, and coordinating the project's campus affiliates program, uh, for years I've taught sociology and especially introduction to sociology uh, courses at a variety of institutions ranging from elite private liberal arts schools to community colleges to uh, 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 campuses in the state university system of California. And a constant challenge for me as a sociologist who started out kind of in love with sociological theory is what's the best way to get students to grapple with Herman and Chomsky's thesis that news reflects, again, in their language, a pattern of manipulation and systematic bias. Maybe a little different from Steve's students. Uh, my students have often uh, read uh, Herman and Chomsky or, or reacted when I've presented it in lecture, uh, reacted to Herman and Chomsky's model with some degree of skepticism. Oh no, not here in the United States. We have a free press. Don't you know, Professor Roth? Um, and so I've found that like I've been, I've been looking at what's the best way to get students to actually engage the material in uh, Herman and Chomsky's model. Uh, and I think there are three kinds of challenges. One is like all theoretical models, it's, a, it's in some sense abstract, right? I don't have time in, my, in a semester to have students read the entire uh, manufacturing consent volume. So we typically look at the theoretical chapter and then I talk some, I, I uh, present some case studies from the subsequent chapters of the book, or as we've mentioned, more updated materials like Rob Williams' um, piece. Uh, that came out a couple years ago. Um, uh, so that they, they, it's a, it, as a theoretical model, it's abstract. It's also old. 1988 for the students that I've taught is ancient history, right? That's uh, in many cases, that is decades before some of them were born. And then of course, it's also an overtly political model. And any one of those, the fact that it's abstract, that it's old, that it's political could be a, 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 a a, a disengagement point for the students in my classrooms. So what I've found, the best way to get into it is I give a brief introduction to the propaganda model and I give them a handy mnemonic for remembering the five filters, OASF, OASSF, right? For uh, ownership, advertising, uh, sources, uh, flack and fear. Um, and, and then I have them do, uh, do something that is a hands-on kind of without saying we're gonna test the model, what they're doing is testing the model. And that's doing the project censored validated independent news exercise, which challenges students to do three basic things, to identify and summarize an important news story that's been covered in the independent press. Most often I have them choose the topic that they want to explore themselves. Second, to determine whether there's been corporate news coverage of that story and third, if so, to compare and contrast the independent news coverage with the corporate news coverage of the story. And I'm gonna come back a little later, a few moments from now and describe each of those three just steps in a little more detail because one of my aims in being on this panel this morning is to recruit more teachers and students to participate in the campus affiliates program. So uh, cards on the table here, you're being recruited. Um, but before I go to talk about the three steps of that uh, assignment exercise a little more, uh, I can say right now, my main point is that in doing that, 
students get to see for themselves directly whether and how the filtering processes that Herman and Chomsky's model describes actually impact a topic of interest to them. So where the propaganda model is abstract and old, the news story that the students investigate, uh, invest, choose to investigate is concrete and contemporary. It brings them in. Uh, what I've found, and, I, and again, uh, coordinating the campus affiliates program, I get to hear from a number of professors across a range of disciplines who engage in this kind of work with their students as well. Students uh, uh, get motivated by the fact that they get to become the expert in the classroom on that story topic. Um, and they also have an opportunity to take their, that expertise and have a voice beyond the classroom, that the project uh, promotes student work, uh, high quality student work by publishing the very best validated independent news summaries on the project's website. Um, and those are linked prominently from the home page of the website. And then ultimately some of those stories end up uh, through a year long vetting process uh, getting selected to be in the top 25 stories that appear in the book every year. Um, so in other words, the exercise provides students to the opportunity to engage in news and politics as active and authorized stakeholders, not as passive consumers. Um, so one of the key things that I've done in my classrooms with this assignment is that when we're done, uh, we take a whole class period, which is precious, right? Time is so precious in our classrooms. Um, we take a whole class period for students to share their findings. And this uh, reflects something that I think we as teachers do too little uh, of uh, often. Uh, we invest too little class time, too little of the class time that we have to having students share with, learn from and teach one another. Um, so in the case of the validated independent news exercise, the sharing begins to reveal these broader patterns of filtering that might not be perceptible if students only knew about the story that they'd researched themselves, that might not be perceptible on an individual case by case basis. And as we go around the classroom and students start to hear all the kinds of stories that have been record reported substantively in the independent media and either uh, ignored altogether or covered in only a limited and perhaps biased way in the corporate media, um, they begin to see, hey, there are limitations to this, to the big juggernaut of the establishment press. And in that way, the classroom becomes a kind of microcosm of what Project Censored has been doing for almost 45 years now. Um, 45 years of top 25 underreported story lists begin to allow us to say, look, it's not just that each one of these individual stories matters profoundly, and that we as a public have been done a disservice by the establishment media in not being informed adequately about these stories, but that collectively taken as a whole, what we begin to see when we look at the, the kind of 45 years of, of underreported news is the blind spots and the third rails and the no-go topics, the no-go zone topics of the establishment press, which amazingly enough tracks fairly well in terms of what Herman and Chomsky uh, argue in Manufacturing Consent about the topics, the kinds of topics, the kinds of issues and perspectives that are systemically excluded as the unacceptable um, uh, uh, material that needs to be filtered. Okay, I think I have maybe two minutes left. Let me do a quick kind of, here are three steps and then I'll point to um, some resources that are online that are available for anyone who's interested in um, um, especially teachers who might be interested in incorporating the validated independent news story into their own um, curriculum. Um, so the first step is having students, uh, and for each of these steps, just very quickly right now, I'm gonna talk about one or two teachable, like this is hackneyed, but I'll call them teachable moments um, that, that come about as students work on that step of the exercise. In story selection, where students are picking an independent news story to research, I think, um, the first thing is, is it a news story? Uh, a lot of students don't necessarily distinguish between opinion and editorial piece uh, uh, articles and actual news reporting. And they're very interesting conversations and issues that get raised when you start pulling on that simple, seemingly obvious thread. Similarly, a big deal for Project Censored is to differentiate between independent and corporate news. What, how do we tell the difference? That comes out every time you have students beginning to research stories, well, is this 
is the, you know, and Steve and I have uh, just a week or two ago, Steve and I were having exactly this conversation about, well, you know, do we count Rolling Stone as an independent news outlet or not? I won't get into that now, but those are interesting and worthwhile conversations in the classroom. Once students have a story, they begin to research the story. Is it important? Is it timely? Is it credible? Is it fact-based and well-documented? Teachable moments here, figuring out what are the defining elements of the story, right? There's a critical thinking skill here in terms of interpretation. That in turn is consequential for specifying the search parameters that students will use when they go to online databases to try to check the extent to which this story has been covered by um, uh, corporate news media. And the final step of, this, of the exercise is to summarize the story. Um, we encourage uh, students to use a journalistic convention, the summary lead to uh, highlight the most important points of the story in the very first sentence or two of their summary. Um, that sounds trite, I'm smiling as I say that, but that actually involves a tremendous amount of, of analytic decision-making. Mm -hmm. um, Beyond that critical thinking, the other key component uh, that the students are authorized to make uh, in my classrooms is you're the one, you're, you the student are the one who's ultimately deciding, has this story been well covered in the corporate press or has it not? Uh, and so there's evaluation and explanation, right? It's an assessment that requires a, a, an effect, an argument to support the, the validity of the assessment. So I'll wrap quickly because I know where you have, um, there's a lively discussion going on in the chat that we want to bring to the fore of the, of the um, uh, uh, panel now. Um, by identifying, evaluating, and summarizing what Project Censored has, uh, has uh, analyzed for years now as validated independent news stories, students are developing their critical thinking skills and their digital media literacy skills in service of something uh, bigger than just their own individual education in a, in a single classroom. They're also contributing to informing the public about the significant news stories that corporate media have failed to cover adequately and that we're indebted to uh, independent media for bringing forward. So um, those I have found in my own experience teaching and as uh, coordinating the campus affiliates program, those are opportunities that students value that students grow from and that I believe uh, uh, stick with students long after they forget the five components of the, of the propaganda model or whatever other pearls of wisdom I may have had to share with them. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I think we'll um, have some good dialogue now in the time we have remaining. Thanks, Andy. Um, thanks so much to Steve, Robin, and Andy. Uh, I know it's always a challenge to deliver so much information uh, into a, a panel slot here. We have an hour this morning. We're going to try to be mindful with the next 10 minutes. Um, of course, uh, I'll, I'll be willing to stick around after if anybody's able to, to talk, but we also want to be mindful because there is another after, a whole afternoon of great program uh, and presentations and participation coming up. Um, I started my segment on junk news with uh, a Walter Lippmann quote and figured I'd end it now to kick off this, this period of discussion. Uh, Andy Roth wrote in the Censored 2020 Through the Looking Glass introduction that Lippmann said there's no higher law for journalism than to tell the truth and shame the devil. Well, at Project Censored, that's what we've been encouraging for over 40 years. And uh, we'd like to sort of use that as our, our segue into what we think are uh, the best kinds of practices for the classroom and helping prepare the next generation of intrepid journalists that are going to go to the no-go zones. And that's one of the areas where I figured we might start with our panel as several people have been talking about what are those no-go zones, Andy? Um, what, what are the kind of things that people, uh, that the corporate press just won't talk about? And of course, we've seen uh, Michael uh, D.D. White said Assange, WikiLeaks, uh, I mentioned election fraud. Andy, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I've, so I've been, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't characterize it as a no-go zone, but I would call it a blind spot. Um, and it's an important one. Um, I spent uh, part of the last academic year working with a student, Spencer Wilkinson at College of Marin. And we were, we were looking back at the all of the uh, previous year's top 25 censored story lists, looking at stories that are about press freedom. So in other words, underreported stories about uh, threats to press freedom, press threats to the integrity of the, uh, and ability of the press to fulfill its uh, uh, 
you know, responsibilities as a, as a watchdog. Um, and the conclusion of, of basically a year's worth of research that we haven't written up formally yet, but I've presented at a few conferences now, uh, is that the establishment media actually does a fairly poor job of reporting threats to its own, uh, uh, its own ability to do its job. Now, probably uh, uh, smart, engaged people hearing me say that now will, will say, but wait, what about over the last you know, two and a half, three years plus under Trump? Uh, and yes, indeed, of course, as, as Trump has uh, defined uh, and attempted to define and certainly maligned uh, the journalists as enemy of the people, um, and there's a ton to say about that, um, uh, the media have begun to push back but uh, Spencer and my analysis is that one way we got to that is that uh, prior to the Trump administration, the press has not done a good job over the past two to three decades of reporting on threats to its own integrity, external threats to its own integrity. Um, so that I would say is like a, an example of a blind spot that is now um, uh, impairing the health of journalism as a profession. Steve or Robin? Uh, could I just quickly chime in and say that I think one huge blind spot for the corporate news media is news having to do with labor unions and the working yes. class. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just take, for example, what's happened over the past, over this past summer, um, you know, in response to the murder of George Floyd, there was an unprecedented wave of wildcat strikes all over the country. And those are those basically did not get reported in the national news media at all. Um, a colleague of mine uh, from you know, way back, Christopher Martin, um, has written a book called No Longer Newsworthy Worthy about how the mainstream media abandoned the working class. Um, it is definitely worth reading. I'm just gonna put the title up there for everyone. Um, what he points out in that book is that if you go back, um, you know, 60, 70 years, every newspaper in the country had a labor beat reporter whose job it was to report on workplace issues, labor issues, and the labor movement. Now there are none. Um, there are virtually no labor reporters left in the country. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in fact, there, there aren't even that many um, uh, reporters who specialize in workplace issues um, anymore. Um, instead, it's been replaced by the business pages, which focuses on the stock market um, and investment news. So that's that would be one example. You know, I'm going to talk about Julian Assange in the next panel at um, in, in, in about a half an hour as an example of global crackdown and how the U.S. Uh, extraditing him from the U.K. a Australian person. Um, is in such a massive step in terms of, of global repression of freedom of the press uh, and in this country and, and everywhere. Um, he is a journalist and he's not a whistleblower. They're charging him with publishing true information that they've got, they, they may have gotten from the wrong type of sources. But the, to date, to the Supreme Court, the US has protected journalists, they can publish even if those sources are uh, nefarious somehow. So, so this will make an enormous impact globally on freedom of the press if, 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 the, if the UK lets him go and they'll disappear him in a supermax prison. The way the media, yes, they completely have ignored the trial. Consortium News and Shadow, Shadow Spread are the only ones that have published anything about it. But um, they have successfully demonized Julian Assange so that other journalists can say, oh, I'm, I'm not Julian Assange, I'm nice. So maybe they won't target me. And that's, of course, very false. So Robin, uh, I would say almost having written the news abuse chapter, there, there usually is some tiny little tidbit of story about almost all the things we don't talk about. But at global warming, it's, it's always about jobs and still the economy rather than we're going to die. <laughs> so um, it's not good. Yeah, Robin, we've also, of course, to riff on that, covering whistleblowers going way back. Um, we were supporters of the National Whistleblower Summit. Andy Roth and I um, had been there a number of years. We've worked with a lot of whistleblower organizations. If people will remember here, perhaps, going all the way back to Gary Webb and the CIA crack cocaine story, talking about stories that we're not allowed to report on. 
Well, it was none other than Peter Phillips who knew Gary Webb that connected him with Seven Stories Press that eventually led to the, the Dark Alliance book, right? You know, because the San Jose Mercury News sacked Webb. Um, and so the, 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 these are ongoing. And I mentioned, I mentioned Webb because I think he's a towering example of how uh, of shooting the messenger is an age old tactic, Assange, the latest manifestation. And I wanna point out that we have a lot of resources online at our site for free. We also are a nonprofit, so we, we do need whatever support we can get. Um, but our movies are online for free going back to 1998. The Gary Webb story is in our first movie uh, going back to 1998. It's called, Is the Press Really Free? The 2013 film is Ending the Reign of Junk Food News. And our latest film, uh, United States of Distraction, Fighting the Fake News Invasion, kind of talks about a lot of the issues we, we were getting into here today, but we didn't get in to go into as much detail. Uh, Harry, thanks so much for that prop there. Rob, thank you also for chiming in. It's true, um, monthly donors are a big help to us, but also like Andy was saying, people wanting to get on board with the curriculum and help contribute to this project. It's a community-based project of civic engagement. Uh, it's a great kind of service learning program. And we do look forward to any of you contacting us. We're more than happy to share any of our resources or accept any of your ideas or constructive criticism about ways that we can broaden what we're doing. Uh, or maybe you can bring something to the table that we haven't yet had the bandwidth to do. Um, is there anyone else that has a question or comment specifically in our, the last couple minutes here or anything our panelists would like to share? You're very welcome, Michael. It's good to see you. It's good to see all of, all of you, those that are here. Anyone? No? Panelists, Steve, Robin, Andy, anything you'd like to, to conclude with? I just think that the the ongoing nature of the work that Project Center does is is really very important, and I, I think that we are carrying on an analysis of the propaganda model and really adding to it. So, well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Robin. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Andy. Thanks to all of you for being here. Another reminder: we also have the weekly Project Censored show on Pacifica Radio. Uh, I'm the executive producer and host of that show. It's on about 50 stations around the U.S. Um, and that's where we cover things every week that are going on. So, and I do cover critical media literacy stuff on the Project Censored show fairly often. So if you're out there and you've got ideas, and I know I'm talking to everybody that's here, <laughs> um, you've got an invitation, contact me, mickey at projectcensored.org. Um, we'd be happy to have you on the program, happy to talk about what you're doing. Uh, our gracious host, Nolan Higdon, has a podcast along the line that every week does the same thing, hard-hitting social justice critical media literacy work. We want to hear from you. We'd love to have you on our platforms to have these open conversations about the importance of critical media literacy and about the significance and big challenge we have of decolonizing the media in the 21st century. So again, um, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. We are officially uh, closing this segment. But as I noted, I'm happy to stay on for a few moments if anybody wants to have a quick chat or address anything that we may have missed. So again, conference reminder, the next session, thank you, Nolan, is at 11.30 Pacific time. Um, you can find the catalog, I'm sorry, the program is at projectcensored.org. You all have the link for that. Thanks to all of you for attending and thank you, Robin, Andy, and Steve for the great work you do with us at the project. The next book, Project Censored State of the Free Press 2021 drops December 1st. If you're interested in seeing it or teaching with it, get a hold of us. We can share stuff ahead of time. We talk about media censorship, deja vu historical censorship, junk food news, news abuse, and media democracy in action, as well as a new graphic chapter on Zoom and the technocratic uh, sort of overtaking of education. So that's all in our new book with a foreword by Matt 